The mission of the Arizona Capitol Museum is to educate visitors on Arizona's governmental, political, and social history. Here you can find historic artifacts, guided interpretation, virtual resources, interactive activities, and public programs. Hi, I'm Melissa Sloan. Welcome to the Arizona Capitol Museum. I'm going to be showing you around and giving you some information. So this is our Capitol building right here. It was started, they started building it in 1898 and finished it around 1901. All of this stone has been from Arizona that they used to build it. When they built it, they knew that they were gonna have to keep expanding because we were such a small territory when they first started. So in 1919, they added another addition to it. In 1938, they added a second addition. In 1960, they built the House of Representatives and the State Senate. And in 1974, they made the Executive Tower, which we can see peeking up over the back right there. At that point, everyone had left the building and they decided to turn it into a museum. And so in 1978, they opened up the museum. As you can see, we have a copper dome and that would be the equivalent of 4.8 million pennies. And at the top of the copper dome, we have winged victory and she is a weather vane. She is 17 feet tall, weighs 600 pounds and when the wind blows greater than six miles an hour, she does slowly start to spin. So as you can see, she's very slowly turning a little bit right now. There was a, there were some rumors back in the day that she used to be shot at by cowboys who wanted to see her spin. They didn't know if this was truth or if this was a legend. And so what they did was when they took her down the 50s to restore her a little bit, they actually did find the bullet holes in her. So they fixed her up and put her back on top. So there's actually no huge significance with her and why she was chosen was because she was the cheapest one in the Sears catalog at about $160. They were trying to maintain a budget of $100,000 they did go over it when they were building the building. However, there are a few things that never got built. For example, above the doors right there, the, on the first floor, they wanted to build a grand staircase to lead to the three doors at the very top. That was cut from the budget. Also in the building, they have uh, an elevator. We have an elevator and an elevator shaft because there was originally supposed to be two elevators and instead only one of them's working. So we just have an elevator cage for the second half. So this is our second floor rotunda here, and below us we have our state seal. On it it says De Tat Deus, which means God and riches. And when they first created the state seal for the idea for it, we were actually the second state to put a state seal into the floor. The first one was Missouri, and they wanted to represent the five C's of our economy. And those are copper, cotton, climate, citrus, and cotton. And when you take a look down there, though, you'll notice, however, we're missing two of the five C's. That's because when they decided of what they wanted and they wrote it out, they sent it to Ohio and they sent us this back. It actually didn't come as a mosaic. It came in like multiple different pieces and they rolled it out. This was in um, 1923. They had a, an event that they were going to do and have a big dance and celebration and everyone was going to be dancing on the seal down here. Unfortunately, when they rolled it out and realized it was a mistake, they weren't sure what they wanted to do. So they decided they, they were not going to cancel the event and instead that they would fix it later. So if you take a look down there, you'll see that we have the sun representing climate, we have the cotton fields, and we have the miner and the copper. However, there are no cattle down there and there are no citrus trees as well. They figured eventually that they would redo it, but it never happened. And in 1978, when we became a museum, this became a historical artifact, so it can no longer be changed. It's actually not an original chandelier. The original one was lost. They're unsure what happened to it. They think it might have been used for scrap metal during World War I or II. So it is a replica based on pictures they have. And the lights, some of them go up and some of them go down. 
electricity was pretty new here in Arizona back then, and they weren't sure if they trusted it completely. And so the ones going up were the gas powered and the ones going down are the electric lights. So the building, when it became a museum, they decided to take it back to looking how it did in the territorial days. It was not shown a lot of love sometimes over the years, and so they had to do a lot of restoration for it. So anything that we have under glass is an actual item. And this right here is a surveyor's chain, and this is what they used to use to map out the state of Arizona. And so it is 22 yards long, and the way the surveyors would use it is one would hold one end, the other would hold the other end, walk the 22 yards, and they would mark it down the map. And so they did that all around the state of Arizona, which is how we got our shape. So this room here shows us maps about how Arizona became a territory. So we start with the timeline over here in the prehistoric civilizations of the modern day Arizona with our indigenous tribes. And we have 22 indigenous tribes here in Arizona. And then we fast forward to 1996. And at this time, a missionary by the name of Father Kino is coming up from Mexico and exploring. And he's also known as one of the first map makers. In 1838, we have been established as the United States of America, and they have begun a westward expansion, which also included Manifest Destiny. In 1848, we are in the Mexican-American War, and at that time, the war ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, so there is a copy of it. And it was sealed with a deal, so we have this, a stamp here, and then just some examples of how the stamp was used with the wax. And at this time, the people in the United States wanted a little bit more land, so they had the Gasden Purchase in 1854. They wanted this land for the Continental Railroad to come through, and also for the mining that we had, so this helped include um, Tucson and stuff where a lot of that copper mining is. However, during this time, what a lot of people did not realize is we were not an Arizona territory yet. We were actually a territory with New Mexico. In 1861, we are now in a civil war. And at this time, the territory was actually kind of split down here at the bottom. And so where now Tucson and stuff are located, they became part of the Confederacy and up here it was part of the Union. And so at this time they had two different territorial governors, two different presidents that they were both, um, both sides were listening to. So in 1863, President Lincoln signed the Organic Act and made Arizona its own territory. And at that time they also became part of the Union. The room we were just in and this room were the uh, governor's offices. And in this room, we do have pictures around that show where he was actually, the, the governors would be signing papers and stuff. These portraits up here, there's 16. Those are our first 16 territorial governors. Because we were not a state, we could not vote for a governor. Instead, the presidents at the time would appoint them. Our very first one was this man right here, Charles Goodwin. And his job was to start a census. We had to have 100,000 people in Arizona to apply for statehood, and we had under 20,000 at that time. So they had to think of other ways to show that we were serious about becoming a state. One of them was to create this Capitol building right here. And another one was to help fight in the Spanish-American War. And so we had the men of Arizona became volunteers known as the Rough Riders, and that's a picture of the Rough Riders right there. And so because they were volunteers to fight in the war, they were not paid for this position. And the person in charge of the Rough Riders, Theodore Roosevelt, they were originally a cavalry. However, when they went to get on the boats to go to Cuba, they realized that it weighed way too much with all their equipment and the horses, and so they became an infantry instead. They also realized the night before they did not have a flag to take into battle. So they reached out to a woman's relief corps and they actually made this flag overnight for them. So if you take a look at it, you'll notice that it's the stars and stuff are not exactly uh, symmetrical. That's because it was made in quite the hurry. And it's made out of silk and hand sewn and stitched. And this flag right here is the one that's up in the picture with the Rough Riders there as well. 
There are only uh, 45 stars in the flag because Arizona, Hawaii, Alaska, New Mexico, and Oklahoma were not states yet. And a lot of people get very interested in this hole that we have up here in the flag. And unfortunately, the story's not that exciting. Instead, what happened was after the war, they took the flag, folded it up, sewed it together, and sent it back to Arizona. And whoever it was that opened the flag just ripped it right open and tore a big hole in it. But we do have some patches and stuff in other little areas that show some damage that happened in the war. And then this room was used as the governor's private office. And these were all used until 1974 when they made the executive tower and that's when the governors moved to the tower. So our very first governor was this man right here, George W.P. Hunt. The W.P. stood for Wiley Paul. His nickname was Old Walrus with uh, the bald head and the bushy mustache. He was our longest serving governor. He served seven non-consecutive terms. That's when they were two term limits. And if you've ever visited the Phoenix Zoo, you may have noticed that at Papago Park right next to it, there's a big white tomb. And that white tomb is Hunt's tomb, and that's actually where he is buried. He is there with his, buried with his wife, his daughter, and um, her in-laws. Now our first female that we had become governor was Rose Mofford in 1988. She was actually Secretary of State, and when the governor before her was impeached, then she rose as the governor. There's a picture of her with Wallace and Ladmo and the Wallace and Ladmo Show, which was a TV series in the 70s and 80s that was filmed just here in Arizona, and kids could go on the show. And she's winning a, a Ladmo bag. They were usually filled with candy and toys and stuff for the kids. And then our first female who was elected into office is Jane D. Hull. She was elected in in 1998. She's also the only woman speaker of the house, and so there is her gavel. She's being pictured right here with four other ladies, and they were nicknamed the Fab Five because for the first and only time in the United States history, we had all five women in the top powers of government. So this is our miners hallway. And we are the only state that actually elects a mine inspector. Every other state has them appointed. And part of the job of the mine inspector is to make sure with the safety of the mines. We have over 100,000 abandoned mines here in Arizona, and they're currently working on finding them and making sure that they um, cannot be accessed and so to keep people safe. We have a whole bunch of collection here of different minerals and rocks and stuff that are found here in Arizona and they can be matched up of the location. Obviously, our biggest um, one we have is copper here, which is found down in Pima County. We also have some mining equipment, stuff they used more in the territorial days and more modern as well. And then here are some of our state artifacts. We have the state fossil is petrified wood. Our state mineral is wolfenite. Our state gemstone is turquoise and our state metal is copper. So in this room we're going to talk a little bit about how we became a state. So at this point we're still a territory. However, we built the Capitol building and we have also helped fight in the Spanish-American War but we still do not have 100,000 people. And so the pre President Taft at the time said that we could become a state with New Mexico, It'd be called joint statehood. This whole thing together right here would be called Arizona. However, the capital would not be in Phoenix, it would be up in Santa Fe. So the people of Arizona were not happy with this. They wanted to become their own state. For example, they were worried that there would not be, there's a lot more people in New Mexico, so they're worried their voices would not be heard or they wouldn't be outvoted if there was a disagreement on something. And plus it would take a long time to travel from Phoenix to Santa Fe. And so President Taft said that we could have joint statehood voting and allowed the states to vote. And so when they did that, the majority of Arizona voted no and the majority of New Mexico voted yes. The ones who voted for joint statehood was 29,336, and the ones against it were 31,000. So we were actually very close to becoming one huge state. Now after this, both of the territories still want to become states. And so in 1910, they made the Enabling Act, 
which basically lists about a bunch of things that we had to do in order to become a state. And one of them was to create a state constitution. And so we had 52 delegates, all males, that met together in what is now our historic House of Representatives, and they started creating our constitution. And it's pictures like this that were used to help identify what the Capitol looked like. So that's how we figured out more of the chandeliers and the carpeting and stuff like that. So here are the 52 delegates. They do have numbers on them so to figure out who sat where. So that way on the desks next door, you can actually see the name plates of who was there. And so of these 52 delegates, only three were actually born in Arizona. Most came from other, uh, other states, even other countries. And the person in charge was, would become our next governor, our first governor, and that was George Hunt up there. And you can even see he has a little spittoon next to him <laughs> in the picture. And then we have a picture here of the delegates, and you'll notice there's a lot of women and children in this picture too, because they did not know how long it would take to become a state. And so they moved their entire family down here to Arizona. So this is our historical House of Representatives and it was used up until 1960. And so the president of the Constitutional Convention sat right up here, which was George Hunt. And then the chief clerk would usually sit down at this table and then these desks show where all the delegates sit. Each of them has a nameplate on it, which shows their name and any information that they could find, they were able to find about the different delegates, where they were born, where they died, jobs they had, and any other positions that they had here in um, government. And so a lot of the jobs are very different than the ones we see now. Many of them worked on the railroads and the mines and were farmers, ranchers, and stuff like that. And so they met here the first time, October 1910, and they started writing out the Constitution. When they were finished, they sent it off to President Taft in DC. At the very first time they sent it off, he did veto it and sent it back. We had a judicial recall in there and he did not approve of that. And so we could not become a state if that was in there. So they met again, they revoted, they decided to take it out and they sent it back to him. At this point, President Taft did approve us, and on February 14th, 1912, we became the 48th state. And at this time, they decided to meet again, where they had the judicial recall to put it right back into the Constitution, and they also added women's right to vote. So we were the eighth state to allow women to vote, and they were able to vote here in Arizona before it was approved nationally. So this is our Lego flag and it's built out of real Legos. It's made out of 113 and 998 blocks and that's equal to the square mileage of Arizona. So this is the Arizona Railroad Historical Society, their model train exhibit and the guys have been working on this and creating it and have built it all themselves. I'm the president of the Arizona Railroad Historical Society. Uh, we have been building this exhibit uh, for the last five, a little over five years. Um, got started about five years ago. Got locked out for about a year and a half with COVID, so we're about three and a half years into a five-year build schedule. What you're seeing is about 70% complete. We've still got a long way to go. The areas of the state that we're representing are simply representative of those areas. Uh, we don't have enough room in here to build the whole city of Phoenix and have anything left over for the rest of the state, right? We're also representing Arizona in the 1950s. That was the transition between steam and diesel locomotives. So by basing this in the 50s, we get to play with both. So Phoenix area here, there's a model of the Capitol building that we're standing in. The portion under the black roof is the original portion. That's this building. The other two buildings behind it were built later. Built in 1898, uh, the territorial governor moved in in 1901. We were not a state when it was built. Probably why it's one of the smallest plainest state houses in the United States. Built with a budget of $136,000. That was a lot of money back then, not so much today, unless you're trying to raise money to build a train set, because 
the budget to build this exhibit is more than the building cost to build. On the website, you'll see this canyon wall being contoured. It's just stacks, flat stacks of this stuff all the way up. Yes. It's called Saguaros and Mermaids, and there's a lot of copper that was used in this as well. And when they heard that there was going to be the, the USS Arizona was going to be named after Arizona, George Hunt did not want to use taxpayer dollars to pay for this, so instead they actually raised the money themselves. All the people of Arizona did and then they had the silver service. There's a misconception that it went down with the ship. However, there was word that there was a possible attack happening and so it was removed months prior to it. And in this room, we have some history about the USS Arizona. We have a piece of the whole of the ship. We're one of the only states besides Hawaii that actually has a piece of the USS Arizona. We also have a flag that was taken out of the ship after it had already sank. And then we do have one of the glasses of the last man champagne set and the bottle of champagne as well. What they were going to do was they were going to have the last two survivors of the USS Arizona make a toast and they decided to not wait until there were two left and they did it when there were four of them left. And so they did the toast and they put took one of the the glasses that was here is actually two of them, and they took one of them and they filled it with champagne and divers put it, and it now lays in the USS Arizona. And then they sent the remaining glass and the bottle back here to the museum. Here, along this railing up on top here, are all the uh, seals for the 15 counties in Arizona. So, the, so that's what this is here. And it starts with the state territorial seal and goes in order of the counties being established. So it's part of the educational tour when people come here. They can learn a little bit about the, the state. This is open to the public. So. The, the, all the lobbies are open to the public, so anytime the building is unlocked, you can be in here. Um, you have to go through security, but once you're through security, you can come in here and you can hang out up here if you wanted to. So now, now we come behind a carded door, right? So this is where all the office space is, and you're going to be back here if you're escorted. So this is not open to the public. Again, we have a little construction going on, but this is our members' lounge that we're coming into now. This is where our members can come and they can talk with each other, with constituents. Um, they, go, they can have meetings in here if they don't want to be in their office, so on and so forth. And um, these are our current members, the 60 members, um, with Ben Toma being our speaker. And here's the leadership, Republican and Democrat leadership. So this is a house chamber. We, we nicknamed it the Grand Canyon uh, because of the Grand Canyon image that we have on the sound baffles around the room here. And so carpet, legend has it, represents the water in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Don't know if that's true, but that's uh, what we say, right? Uh, we have some weavings on the back wall here that are on loan to the house. These are Navajo. 60 representatives. There are 30 districts and each district has two representatives and one senator. And so these are the 60 representatives. These are all Republicans, and these are all Democrats, except for this one. This is Republican, because it's 3129. This, this guy, he's, he, he volunteered to be on this side of the room. Not that it, that's a big deal, but, uh, but that's how it's laid out with the leadership in the front for each party, Republican leadership up there, Democrat leadership up here. We have some blue chairs up there in the front where pages sit. The pages assist while we're in session. So for instance, I could push my page button here and a page 
would see a light light up on a board up there and come back and say, Mr. Montenegro, what do you need? And I could say, go to my office and get my laptop. But they can go and then go to their office and get their laptop if they want to. If we're voting, they have to stay in the room. So a lot of times the page buttons are used while they're voting because they can't go anywhere, right? You know, go give this to my assistant or go, go tell the person waiting in the lobby for me, I'm going to be another hour, you know, whatever. So pages can do that for them. This is, this is a projector. So it projects to a screen that comes down in the front of the room. So when they vote, their vote is seen. You can't, you can't hide from your vote here. It's, 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 in, it's in plain sight of everybody and you have to vote. It's not like in DC where you can vote present. If you're here, you have to vote. You're compelled to vote. And um, we've had some, some times where members didn't want to vote. They thought the bill was so ridiculous, I don't want to waste my time. Or they don't want they don't want to be known by their constituents either way on that particular bill right half their constituents may hate them half may love them whatever for whatever reason but you have to vote all all time between the gavels you know you gavel in the gavel out all that's it's streamed online and it's recorded and it's stored forever what does a sergeant in arms do it's a lot uh the short there's there's two short versions one is um maintain good working order of the house. Another short one is um, I'm responsible for civility and decorum in the house. Basically anything in the building, in the house, in the parking lots, you know, the grounds that doesn't have to do with policy will typically land on my desk. I'm, I'm a nonpartisan position, so I don't talk about bills. I don't, you know, I don't speak on bills. I don't do anything like that. Completely nonpartisan. And so I'm here to serve everybody that's associated with this, whether they're sitting in this room or their assistants or their pages or security or museum people, whoever it is, uh, if they're here, I'm here to serve them, right? So what does that mean? I'm responsible for the building. So all the projects that are going on, that, that flows through me. Then there's security, uh, both uh, people and property while in the building. So we have cameras everywhere in the public areas, not in the office areas or, the, or behind the card, carded doors, but all the public areas we have every, every inch on camera. Another thing with the building is it's, it's housekeeping. It's cleaning the bathrooms. It's you know vacuuming the floor, whatever it is, those, those folks report to me as well. Um, then we have the page office, all the pages report to me. And so that, they're the customer service part of the building, so to speak, and they're here year round. Uh, some are only here when we're in session, but we have pages here right now. We have six pages in the building. So if we needed something done, we'd have the pages help us do that. Well, I get here at 6.30 and I leave at 4.30. So it's 10 hour day. So uh, we joke around here that, you know, during the off session time, we call that the interim between sessions, people, have flexible work schedules and everybody's trying to work four tens and that sort of thing. I work five tens. So, and that's, that's kind of the joke. So I'm here, I'm here a lot. I'm here early because that's when all the construction things t tend to happen. And uh, I'm here late when they're here on the floor during session, I'm out on the floor here with them. There are some things I think are key. You have to have great people skills. Uh, you have to be able to communicate very well. And um, you have to um, know how, how and when to take charge. So the members, they, they can't speak unless they were given permission, right? So until they're given permission, their microphone's not live. So if they wanna talk, they hit the button to request to speak. And the person in that chair decides whether to call on them or not. If they don't get called on, they don't speak, right? And so there's some decorum things like that and sometimes things get a little out of hand, so I may have to go stand behind somebody and just make my presence felt and all that. The members run the show. I don't run anything. I'm just here to make sure it's running, right? And help in any way I can. I don't run this. I'm, I'm far from running this. The members run it themselves, and there's typically enough respect for the speaker. The speaker runs everything. We all serve at the pleasure of the speaker, We, you know? Uh, we, if he doesn't want us working here anymore, we're not working here anymore, right? But that's not true with the members. The members have to be voted out if there's a problem.
right? They vote on themselves. So we had a member this past year that um, uh, was deemed to do something unethical, and so they, they held a vote and decided to kick her out. And that's a big deal. That's a really big deal because it's not the members that put that rep here. It was all the constituents that put that rep here. So you're overdoing the will of the people when you kick somebody out of here, right? So it has to be pretty grievous. So this is a bus that we have of Polly Rosenbaum. And we actually have a building named after her as well. And that's where we have all of our stuff that we do not have all the collections and all archives are kept there. And she actually took her husband's spot as a representative when he passed away unexpectedly. And she worked here until she was about 94 years old. And something that's interesting about her is she also did not believe in using the elevators. And so she thought, you know, if you're able-bodied enough, you need to be taking the stairs. And so she would use the stairs all the time. And this was actually created by Rusty Bowers, who was the uh, previous Speaker of the House that we had. He's also an artist. And the reason why she's tilted this way instead of looking out at everyone is she's actually looking at the second portrait that's up here that we can go look at, and that's her husband. Yes. So this is a public gallery.